Well, Michael West, of course, was talking in the film there about the yin and the yang and, and maintaining that balance. What is it that, uh, in terms of telomerase, that, that maintains that balance, that it doesn't you know, go too much or too little? Um, so surprisingly, we know very little about it. Um, and so it's, it's an active area of research, but we've learned very little so far about how telomerase levels are actually controlled in normal cells. What we do know is that you need some of it, and if you don't have enough, um, you have problems. Um, but normal cells manage to control the levels in such a way that there isn't enough for them to be immortal. How they actually do that, um, we've got years of research ahead. So you're able to take human cells in the laboratory and add telomerase? Yes. Okay, how do you do that? Um, um, it turns out to be surprisingly simple um, and we don't quite understand how it works because um, uh, Scott Cohen, um, uh, working uh, in my lab at the Children's Medical Research Institute just three years ago, um, showed that human telomerase has three molecular subunits. Each of those subunits is coded for by a separate gene. But it turns out, and this was work that was first done in 1999, um, you can turn up the production of just one of those subunits and that's enough to give you an increase in the overall telomerase level, even though it's only one of the three subunits. Now, how that actually works um, uh, is a matter for further research, but experimentally we can do it. I was remiss, of course, in not pointing out that uh, Roger is the Lorimer Dodds Professor and Director of the Children's Medical Research Institute in Sydney, um, which I should have done at the beginning of the program. So you, you can do this in the lab. What is, what's the difficulty with doing that sort of in normal human beings? We, at, at the moment, we don't really have the technology um, to do that reliably in a way that we would be confident doesn't um, predispose those cells um, to cancer. So there have been lots of advances with gene therapy in recent years. Um, not many of them have really made their way effectively to the, uh, to the bedside yet. Um, but it is something that I, th I think will become um, increasingly adopted into medicine over, over the years ahead. And that is being able to take a normal copy of a gene, put it into certain cells and put them back into the body. Or um, uh, use a vector, so something that carries a gene and targets a particular target cells within tissues in the body. Um, that can be done in experimental animals. Um, um, it hasn't been widely applied in clinical medicine yet, but that's coming. But there are technical issues there as to um, how you, you exert fine control over what we call the expression level. So how much of the gene product is being made in those cells um, that have not yet been solved. Um, but that, that will come. I mean, these are technical issues that can be sorted out. So you, so you foresee a time when we can introduce telomerase in a way that, that addresses the problem that Sonia was raising about, you know, you might have the precancerous cells that might you know, accelerate them f straight into cancer, which probably wouldn't have happened if you didn't introduce the enzyme. Um, that's speculative, but in, in principle, I think the answer is yes. Um, there was a very interesting experiment done in Professor Jerry Shea's lab um, in Texas um, quite a few years ago, and it really hasn't got the attention that it deserves. And what he did was take some normal human cells, so this is just in the lab, uh, so it's not in people, but he took some normal human cells um, he used a genetic trick um, that allows telomerase to be expressed for a short period of time um, and then to be removed from those cells. So he did this in cells that were getting to the end of their age, um, of their lifespan. Um, so they're, they were aging. Um, what he, just by turning telomerase on for a short period of time, these cells became rejuvenated and proliferated for far longer than they would have otherwise. Now, that, as I say, um, that's something that can be done in the lab, um, uh, but if, and that's a proof of principle experiment, I guess. Um, but if that 
when that can be done um, in the human body, um, uh, then some of those issues can be addressed. Mm. Roger, how long have you been working with telomeres? Um, I've been working with telomeres since 1994. Uh, so um, that was when a graduate student um, in my lab, Tracy Bryan, um, took on telomeres as a, as a project to understand cellular immortalization. Um, and Tracy actually discovered a non-telomerase mechanism for maintaining telomeres um, that we call alternative lengthening of telomeres. Um, and it turns out that 85% um, of all cancers use telomerase, the other 10 or 15% use alternative lengthening of telomeres or all. And what, what is that exactly? Um, so that's um, a, a different mechanism for uh, synthesizing uh, new telomeric DNA. Um, so instead of using the telomerase enzyme, there's a DNA replication uh, process uh, where DNA copies DNA. Hmm. And would, would healthy cells do that as well or not? Um, so that's um, a very active area of, con of, of experimentation in our lab at the moment, um, and we believe the answer is yes. So again, it's highly analogous to telomerase, though, that there is a low level of this alternative lengthening of telomeres activity going on in normal cells, but not enough to immortalise them. And I'll just get back to you in a moment. But um, <laughs> how would you describe, Roger, the, the development of research in the sort of telomere era, area in Australia? How's oh. it come along? Oh, in Australia? Um, so there's, there's a, it's, it's a growing area of interest. Um, we, held, uh, we hold um, a telomere conference every two years in Australia, and typically there are um, 50 or so people who come along, um, and there are more than that who work on, on telomere biology in, in some shape or form, including some people in the audience here tonight uh, who are telomere researchers. Um, and um, yeah, it's, it's, a, it's a growing area. Hmm. What about funding? How's that going? <laughs> <laughs> never enough, I think. <laughs> <laughs> yes, of course, there's never enough. But um, uh, yes, there's, uh, I've been extremely fortunate um, that my research in immortalisation has been funded continuously uh, by Cancer Council New South Wales. Uh, so ever since I started on this in Sydney um, in 1988, um, they've funded me continuously and I've had the support of the Children's Medical Research Institute and it's Genes for Genes campaign, so the public have been directly supporting this research uh, for many years. Um, so there, there could always be more, but um, we, we're very grateful for what we get. 